Hi everyone, welcome to one of our author chats here at NCTE. I'm so excited today to be joined by Sue Fleiss. She's done a lot of books with us here at AW, uh, and we're going to talk about her latest fractured fairy tale. Just a few housekeeping rules. If you do have any questions for Sue, we're happy to ask them. Just drop them in the chat box below. And if you have any questions about any of her books or any other books um, that you noticed in our booth at NCTE, you can contact us at marketing at albertwhitman.com with any questions. Um, I'm Lisa White. I work in marketing at Albert Whitman, um, and I'm so excited. I'm going to have Sue introduce herself and tell you a little bit more about her books. Sue, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you to Albert Whitman for inviting me to do an author chat. Um, it's always nice to be able to chat with teachers. I wish I could see you more in person this, this year. Um, even though I've been doing some virtual um, school visits, um, of course, we all miss the in-person, but I guess this is the next best thing. Um, so I'm really excited about um, all my Albert Whitman books, but one in particular that I have coming out in April, um, Goldilocks and the Three Engineers. Um, so following all of my um, sort of girl power STEM books, um, this one is about Goldilocks, who is kind of a tinkerer and inventor, and she goes to her maker space and she's inventing and she gets inventor's block. So kind of like how I can relate sometimes with writer's block and I go for a walk, Goldilocks goes for a walk. So or it's a fractured fairy tale. So instead of the three bears making their porridge and going for a walk, Goldilocks decides she needs to go try to find some inspiration. And while she's gone, the three bears who happen to be engineers um, come upon her maker space and they come in and they help to improve all of her existing inventions. And um, instead of, you know, being sort of horrified when she sees them in her, um, in her little maker space and lab, um, she actually is really impressed by them. So it's kind of about teamwork and um, how, you know, more, more than one brain is sometimes better to tackle problems and, um, of course, the bears are adorable, and Petros Bulubasis has done the illustrations for this one again. Um, so they're quirky and fun, and I just love his style, so I hope you do too. Um, he also did The Princess and the Petri Dish, which came out this year, and that's, of course, Princess Pippa, who decided she uh, wanted to invent a better tasting pea. And he also did Mary Had a Little Lab, which came out a couple of years ago, um, where Mary is an inventor and she creates a sheep in her lab. And he also illustrated Little Red Rhyming Hood. So these are sort of my fractured fairy tales that I have with Albert Whitman. Um, and I hope you will check them out. Um, and let me see, what else can I, what else can I tell you about those? Um, this one, I actually wrote three different versions of this book before we figured out what the actual story was. Um, and so the fine editorial team at Albert Whitman um, let me know what wasn't working. And then I went back to the drawing board and then figured out what Goldilocks story was. So um, that was fun and a little tense for me because I thought I nailed it and then realized I didn't nail it and then went back. But it always seems to be that when you finally get it right, it feels like that was the only version that ever should have existed. So um, in that way, I hope you uh, enjoy the story and it's kind of funny and quirky and um, lots of things to look at in the book. Definitely. Um, and I think this is a good do one. Do you want to ask or... me any questions, Lisa, or should I talk about, you know, something else or what, what do you want to do? No, we can definitely ask questions. Um, first off, you know, you mentioned that you, uh, Petrus has worked with you in all of these books, which is really exciting. Um, it's been really fun yeah. to see you guys work together to create these really fun stories and just little things that are hidden within his art that is so great. Um, starting with Mary Had a Little Lab, which I love, which came out in 2018. Um, what's it been like working with the same kind of illustrator um, for all of your books? Yeah, so... Um... Petros is awesome. And I, I did, I'm, I might have mentioned this a while ago, but it's always good to remind people that I don't usually get to meet any illustrators that I work with, or most authors don't get to meet their illustrators, um, unless you happen to be going to the same conference or you happen to be in the same region for some reason. Um, but with Petros, he lives in Greece, he lives in Athens. And um, 
as my family always says, we're so glad we took that trip when we did. We took a big family trip to, um, to Greece and we, we went to Croatia and Greece um, the summer of 2019. And I was going, we were gonna be in Athens for just two days. And I emailed Petros and I said, hey, it's your random author friend from the United States. We're gonna be in Athens for just two mornings. Would you happen to be there? And would you want to meet for coffee? And he said he absolutely would want to meet for a coffee. So we met, um, we signed books for each other, our own books. And then he also gave me one of his books that's in um, Greek. Um, and he sat there and told me what the story was about because I can't read Greek. Um, but so that was awesome. And so I told him, I got to tell him in person how much I love his quirky illustration style. And, you know, after he did Mary Had a Little Lab, I and and they Albert Whitman decided to sign up other books with him that I was going to do. I was so excited because I knew um, it was going to be fun and surprising. And he puts all these tiny little details in. And when I go to visit schools and um, I'll have, you know, the, the pictures of the book up on the big screen or whatever, and they have found things that I didn't even see. Um, one, one in Mary Had a Little Lab where the sheepinator is being propped up by a bunch of random, um, like even you can see right here, a bunch of random things, a stack of books, some little, um, some little cups maybe. And then somebody said, oh, look, a wine glass. And I said, oh, that's perfect. Oh, sorry, did you get, not to get to see that. It's a wine glass on top of the books. And so things like that, where I, I will go back over and over, even on my own books and, and look for these cool little things that, um, you know, some, I didn't even notice this on the cover one time where the sheep has eaten a little, taken a little bite out of the word um, lab. So um, little things like that. It's, it's really fun to show the kids and ask them, you know, if they can find any sort of hidden um, humor in the, in the illustration. So um, I'm always excited when he um, is assigned to a book that I'm working on and hopefully we'll do some more in the future. Um, and, you know, I look forward to I look forward to that possibility, so. Yeah, his details are so great and he just brings them really to life. So um, these are all, you know, this whole series that you've done with us has been Fractured Fairy Tales. You've done other books as well and we can talk about those, but what made you wanna really uh, focus on the STEM aspect of these books? And especially like highlighting girls in STEM as well. Yeah, so, um... It's funny, I mean, my the Mary Had a Little Lab, that idea came to me um, in a dream, um, which when I, I have two Labrador retrievers at home. Um, and so when I dreamt of this title, that's really what happened was I dreamt of this title and I woke up and thought, oh, Mary Had a Little Lab, you know, that's very specific kind of dog for, um, you know, for a girl to have, and that's probably not have wide appeal. And then all of a sudden it hit me that lab, of course, doesn't have to be Labrador. It can be short for laboratory. And then the, po the possibilities just kept coming up. And as soon as I got on that, I said, I really want to do more books like this to show girls doing science, but in a fun and silly way that it um, kind of takes the pressure off. It's not so much, you know, you have to be the absolute you know, best in your field, but you can, you can experiment and you, and that's what science is all about, right? So even with um, Mary had a little lab, she, she tries a, a bunch of different things in the beginning. She tries, you know, different experiments and they go wrong. And um, in P Princess in the Petri dish, you know, she makes hand soap that turns your hands blue by accident. And, um, you know, she makes a mouthwash that makes your breath smell bad. So I try to highlight that, you know, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to fail. And, you know, I don't remember the stat, but it's like what you've, you know, fail a thousand times before you succeed. And um, so that's what I was trying to show that it's okay. And also for girls to see themselves as scientists or inventors. And what I love about these books too, is that boys love them. So boys are obviously getting to embrace that they're seeing a girl character and they don't obviously they don't care you know they don't care what if it's a boy or a girl character doing it and um when i've visited elementary schools we would act out um the sheepinator and i have a little like sheep thing and so someone can be a sheep someone can be mary um and then there's like three other kids i usually pick to be part of the machine whatever machine they are going to create. But, you know, we do the sheepinator and they have to move like the machine. 
And three times in a row at school visits, boys volunteered to be Mary. So, you know, it, it just really, um, it's lovely um, that that happens. And, um, you know, they all, they all want to be the sheep too, of course, because there's a sheep outfit that they can put on. But um, so anyway, that's, that really makes me feel like I'm doing something right. Not just writing a silly fun story when I see that, you know, kids, oh, I like to, I like to use chemistry and I, you know, those kind of things. So um, yeah. And even in um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, or sorry, the Three Engineers, um, I, they asked me if I ever, um, somebody asked me if I ever invented something. And I said, well, not really, but I can remember going on long car trips with my family and my parents, of course, they're in the front and they're driving so they can dictate what station is on the radio. And this was, you know, I, I had a Sony Walkman, but really what I wanted was I wanted to hear it in the car. And I invented, I had a long um, like rod and I put an eraser at the end, like a pointy eraser and I brought it on the car trip and I could poke the, the buttons on the um, radio. And my mom, you know, my mom obviously noticed right away, but I was like, I invented a way to change it from the back seat, you know? So, um, you know, kind of fun. And I mean, kids always can think of weird things that they would want to, you know, make or invent. Um, and so I use that book a lot to talk about, uh, Mary had a little lab to talk about if you could invent anything or any kind of machine to make something. Um, we get a lot of puppies, kittens, unicorns. Um, but then, you know, there are some kids that are really ready for the future. And they're like, I, I want a machine that makes money. I'm like, well, me too. When, when you've figured that one out, let me know. <laughs> The, the creative ingenuity of kids. I love it. Yeah. Um, and I think the nice thing too about with Mary Had a Little Lab is this idea of even if you make a mistake, you can change and pivot and problem solve. Um, a little spoiler alert, there's too many sheep that the, the machine creates and Mary Had a Little Lab, but she's able to figure out like, well, what can we do with these sheep? And she's able to use it to, you know, make sweaters and do things with that. And that aspect of like, even if something doesn't work out yeah. the way you have planned, you can still figure out something to do with it, um, which I think is a great lesson for kids yeah. in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because even if it's like, well, it's sort of a mistake, what can you do with that mistake? You know, I love that book, um, Beautiful Oops, where it's kind of about, um, you know, making something and it doesn't turn out just exactly how you like, but it's still beautiful, you know, in that, in its own way. So exactly. Now, um, like I said, these books are um, for age groups four to eight and grades uh, pre-K to three. Um, and they're all kind of focused on fractured fairy tales. Uh, Mary Had a Little Lab was the first one, then Little Red Riding Hood, The Princess in the Petri Dish. And then like we said, Goldilocks and the Three Engineers, it comes out next April. Um, and you can pre-order it now. The rest of the other books are already available, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you start to write these books, what is the first thing that you kind of think of? What's your writing process as an author? Um, well, the first thing I try to do is make connections with um, the story itself and then how I'm going to change it. So with uh, Mary Had a Little Lab, it came. the title came to me, but I realized I have to pull and draw on um, aspects of the original story or the original song or fairy tale, um, and, and in this case, a nursery rhyme. So I thought, okay, there has to be some sheep in it um there has to be Mary although I did consider making her name different just because I was throwing everything out there and I thought no it still needs to be recognizable as Mary had a little something um and then if she had you know if she if she had a laboratory was she going what kind of science was she going to be doing um but it seemed so that one seemed more obvious because there was a sheep already in the initial um nursery rhyme that they're you know something she has to do something with a sheep in the lab and at first I thought well maybe she has a sheep helper um, that follows her around and I thought or she she makes the sheep so I actually had a um an editor reject Mary had a little lab um because now I do not say cloning anywhere in the book but the editor's response was, you know, we really liked this, but we just didn't want to go there. We didn't want to touch on cloning and have to have parents explain that there's sheep cloning. And I thought, oh goodness, you know, I did not intend for anyone to have to explain cloning. Um, but, you know, so you, even though I'm thinking fun, fun, you know, that people do dissect it. Um, let me think with um, the princess and the Petri dish, um, 
that actually was when I thought, oh, I want to do another one of these. Um, I thought of, a, I went through all of the fairy tales. Um, surprisingly, there's not all that many that have a female main character. Um, I mean, there is, there's Snow White and like some of the, but the ones that seem to be more easily transferred into fractured, fractured stories, um, there weren't a ton of, you know, strong female leads. Um, and so for this one, I thought, oh, the princess and the pea. And even then she's kind of, you know, secondary, the queen sort of rules that, that fairy tale with, you know, having all the different rules she has to follow. So I just thought there has to be a princess and I wanted her to be some kind of scientist or STEM or something. I wasn't sure exactly what. Um, and then there has to be something with a P. And then the title just came to me like pet science. And I was looking up scientific terms and I thought Petri dish. And I sent that to my agent because I had sent her a bunch of different titles. Like, what do you think of these? And then at the very end, I thought, oh, princess in the Petri dish. She's like, that's the one, that's it. But then I thought, okay, what now I have to actually figure out the story. And this story went through a lot as well. There were, um, it started out that there was all these different kingdoms involved. Um, they were making a festival of vegetables. I mean, it was out there. It was very creative and funny, but not very focused. And my critique group, which I, I meet with my critique group still once a month, um, virtually, of course. Um, but that was even happening. When I moved to, from California to Virginia, we were already meeting virtually the last five years. So that was not really a long leap for us. But um, they said, you know, you've got to, you've really got to boil it down to the essence because I had her, you know, making these I think she was going to do some carrots and this, and she was making some stew. I mean, it was all over the place. And my friend Tim said to me, Sue, you know, you write so much in rhyme. And of course, Mary had a little lab. It started as a rhyme. So that one was also easier to just, okay, I'm going to use the same rhyme scheme. But the princess and the pea is not in rhyme, nor is Goldilocks and the Three Bears, nor is Little Red Riding Hood. So for me, I was trying to just write the story first and get that down. And when I was having a lot of trouble reining it in, um, my friend Tim said, you know, well, why don't you try writing it in rhyme? Because you seem to be able to boil the story down to its essence easier. And then you can go from there once you have the story. Well, once I, I rewrote it again, tw 12 times I rewrote The Princess and the Petri Dish, by the way. <laughs> It was painful, <laughs> but worth it. But um, at the very end, when I had what I thought was this rhyming story and figured out what the story was, I loved how it sounded in rhyme. And my critique group then helped me, you know, polish it. And then it ended up being in rhyme. So then when Goldilocks and the Three Engineers came along, I thought, well, I've done this before and I've tried <laughs> just like they do in, their, in these books, you know, tried unsuccessfully first. And I thought, why don't I start with rhyme? <laughs> and see if I can pull it off. And then if I can't, I'll, I'll venture into um, prose. So uh, for me, and that's not true for all writers, but for me, writing in rhyme is actually easier than writing in prose. And I think it's because it gives me structure and boundaries. Um, whereas when I start writing in prose, I just add words and add sentences and add plots and add subplots. And all of a sudden I'm like, this is supposed to be a picture book and it's very complicated now. Um, so anyway, so I think that was a very long answer to your question, um, but I just love that these, um, these girl characters are experimenting and trying new things. And I mean, I always encourage kids, you know, that's the same with what you wanna do when you grow up. You know, you end up trying a lot of different things before you find out what you really love and before you find what you, you know, call success. And, um, you know, I tell kids, I didn't start writing picture books until I was in my 30s. So um, I was doing a lot of other marketing and writing type things, but, um, you know, take some, some figuring out, out, navigating through a bunch of different things before you really find it. Yeah. I think that's the neat thing about publishing is there's a lot of people that have had other careers and get into publishing a little bit later in their career. And <gasps> it's a creativity that they find that they love, but um yeah, it's, an, it's neat to be around a lot of folks that are finding this creative outlet later in life. Yeah. It's not something, it's, it's a good message to kids that, yeah, you don't have to know everything right away. You could yeah. learn stuff. 
And I always say, you know, when I, when I wish that an, I had, when I was in elementary school, I had had an author come and even just to expose me to um, a writing life, because I just didn't even realize that was a, you know, a possibility. Didn't really think it through. My parent, my mom was uh, accounting and my dad was in pharmaceutical sales. He was a biology teacher. And then got into the pharmaceutical side of things. And he was like a, you know, marketing person for a, a, you know, marketing manager for a pharmaceutical company. So my view of jobs was, it wasn't, it wasn't on the, I shouldn't say, I think every job has creative aspects to it. I should say that just to be clear, but um, you know, I thought, well, I don't really want to do sales and I'm definitely don't want to do accounting. And I mean, my parents always supported, I actually wanted to be an artist. I took art, lessons all my life. I, I went to school and majored in art and then I changed it to a minor. Um, but it was just like on the side, with, I was always writing on the side. And I, just, I tell kids, I wish someone had come to my school and said, no, actually you can do this. This is a job you can have one day. Um, you can write or illustrate or both your own children's books. And um, so I, I always take that opportunity to tell them like, even if you decide, you know, I, I'm a terrible writer, I hate writing. If you like to draw, that's another way to tell a story. And you know, there's a lot of wordless picture books. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, it's definitely definitely something that's fun and creative to do for kids. Um, now, you talk about going to school visits, and I know you've done a lot of them. You know, pre-pandemic and even after, been meeting with kids and online as well. Um, what are some of the fun things that you've got to do with this book? Because um, I do know you have some fun activities as well for these books. What is oh, for, um, for Goldilocks and the Three Engineers? For really all of them. I, fe I feel like you've yeah, done I mean, really cool funny stuff. funny because I, I have not really started to sink my teeth into what I will do with, with this one. Um, you know, they she makes porridge. Um, I'm trying to think of the things. So she makes porridge. She has a chair that wheels around and you can sit the, the baby. It's sort of made for a baby bear size um, kid that that feeds him, wipes his mouth and reads to him. Um, and then they have a bed that rocks them to sleep, but maybe I could do something, some kind of an experiment with honey. You know, I have to think about it a little bit more um, because on zoom, it's a little trickier, um, especially if I'm going to have honey in my office in front of my computer. <laughs> um, but yeah, with, um, you know, like I said, with Mary had a little lab, I have them recreate um, the sheepinator, the machine and become parts of that. Um, with Little Red Rhyming Hood, um, I've had kids at school visits um, role play, like, um, like almost like a play, because in the end they have a poetry contest and Big Brad Wolf and Little Red end up reading, um, they, they um, alternate lines of the poem that they wrote together. Um, so sometimes we could do a group poem. Um, I will write the first line and then the kids will write the second and I'll help them with the, you know, the rhyming word at the end. Um, and yeah, and then with, with, with all of my books that are in rhyme, I always talk about rhyme and meter and have the kids try to help me. Uh, I usually use nursery rhymes that they're familiar with already because we don't know. You'd be surprised though. I feel like not a lot of nursery rhymes are, are staying alive these days, um, but they always know Humpty Dumpty and Mary had a little lamb. Um, and so I will put that on there and they will see and listen to what the, the word should be, even if they're not totally familiar with what it is, they know that it's going to rhyme once I um, talk about it. So we kind of do rhymes together. Um, I've even created rhymes with them where I have um, uh, cardboard, just cardboard with different words and we rearrange them. The kids hold them and rearrange them until we can get something that rhymes, you know, and then they really hear the meter and, um, and then here, you know, I, th I think I did it with something about making cookies. So there's like lunch and munch and crunch and, you know, the kids laugh because they rearrange them and then they can be, can be really silly, um, which is obviously totally okay. <laughs> yeah. And I think with these 10 books too, it's, it's fun to see teachers create stuff. Cause I, I run all of our social media. And so I've seen teachers actually create lessons and fun activities with these books. Um, I've seen art projects. Oh my gosh, they're crazy. way better than the activities that I come up with. The they're teachers so that have those things, I'm like, that's amazing. I'm going to use that in my next school visit. Um, I've which seen them. Um, and I'm, you know, and growth. I'm also so close to it, you know? Yeah. I've seen some seed growth with Petri dish. Um, I definitely saw a lot of cotton ball uh, sheeps being created and things like that with the sheepinator. Yeah. 
it's yeah. always so fun when we get tagged by teachers and get to see all the cool stuff they get to do with these books yeah um I do want to say if you guys have any questions for Sue just drop them in the chat we're happy to answer them um I do want to say also uh we did do another uh, we did a couple of books as well before Mary had yeah. a little lab in these fractured fairy tales um the earth gives more from here to there. Did you want to talk about any of those as well? Sure. Um, yeah, I brought them over too. From here to there, which this one I feel like maybe I was uh, foreshadowing this pandemic. <laughs> so it's about here and there who can who are friends, but they can never be together because here is always here and there is always there, and they become pen pals um, in order to you know keep in touch and eventually there realizes he can sort of be creative. There's even some STEM involved in this one, which is a little more of a stretch, but he makes his tea into a scooter. And so then the scooter is underneath and then he goes to here's house and here says, you're here now because the tea is now underneath him as a scooter and he looks like he's here. Um, so it's, it's one of these like, across the distance type things. Um, I've had friends tell me they bought this to send it to, you know, family members that are far away. Um, I've had a, a military organization ask me, oh, that would be great for military families because, um, and also divorced parents um, and things like that to just, you know, stay together. Um, but this was, I will say, this is probably the the best last line I've ever written in a book that I was so <laughs> proud of. Um, so they eventually they, you know, they, they leave, they'll say, you know, but soon it was time to go. We both knew I couldn't stay here forever, said there. I'll be here whenever you need me. I'll always be there for you. Even when you're there and I'm here, we'll find a way to be together, said here. And the two friends knew they were only never more than one letter apart. So I know, right? I, I was when I and that actually came through a revision. I didn't have that last line in there. I had changed, I had changed it around a little bit. And then I thought, oh, the one letter, they're writing letters, you know, and it just was one of those things like sort of happened organically, but um. You know, and I always even tell that to, you know, my mom, you know, she and I used to write letters more. Now we email and we FaceTime and, um, you know, the, the value of letter and letter writing is um, kind of a lost art. So there's even a postcard on my website that Albert Whitman created to, um, if you guys, you know, download a postcard and you can do a postcard writing. Um, and I will answer any postcards that are sent to me. I will send a letter back. Um, and then the earth gives more is my love letter to Mother Earth. Um, I wrote it a couple of years ago, kind of inspired by, um, you know, Greta Thunberg and also just all the, you know, people trying to do good things to, you know, really protect the earth and combat climate change and all that. So, um, but yeah, so it's a beautifully, a beautifully done book, um, a Christian Engel. She also did, um, here to there, from here to there. That's funny. I just realized that she did those two books and Petros did all my other Albert Whitman books. Um, but yeah, so like things like this were camping, you know, wish on stars and nighttime skies, welcome every new surprise. Um, yeah, the art in that one is just beautiful. What you know, so yeah, it's, it, she, she did such a great job. Um, and it just has the repeating phrase of, you know, still the earth gives more. Um, and it's a nice, nice, diverse group of kids. Um, there's even a child in a wheelchair, which of course they don't focus on the fact that, that she's in a wheelchair, but she's in every, um, you know, they, they go from family to family. And so I just felt like that is a really beautiful book, but also, um, you know, a tribute at the same time, um, to protecting the earth. So, and we do have a question. Um, mm -hmm. so Tiffany said, hi, Sue, thanks for doing this. Um, she asked if you had already shared your hopes for what children will take away from your books, your highest hopes for them. Oh, that's such a hard, that's a hard question. It's a good question though. Um, I mean, I think mostly I just want them to have joy. You know, my, my books are kind of silly and fun. Um, 
you know, sometimes I wish I've written that one that's going to, you know, win the award for having the most deepest meaning. And uh, that's just not really what I write. Maybe one day I will write something like that. But I love, I loved silly, funny books. Um, I still love humorous books. Um, so that's what comes out when I write. I mean, The Earth Gives More is a little bit more serious, but it's kind of light, a lighthearted. It's not, you know, doom and gloom. <laughs> the Earth is dying before our eyes. Um, so yeah, my, my hope would just be that it gives them a little bit of an escape and also just to enjoy it, just fun. Um, you know, I have books with animals driving cars, um, animals driving trucks. I have a soup, superheroes and robots. So mostly it's, it's just fun um, and just, you know, lighthearted, so. Yeah, and Tony says she loves that. So that's great. Okay. That is, I, I do love your books. Cause like, yeah, they do make everything fun. Even whenever it's like talking about science or talking about something serious, it's still got a lot of fun to it. Um, and, and I will say that I feel like the illustrator does 50% of the heavy lifting there too, because as fun as I can make my text, they can add these, all these other elements that, oh my gosh. And I will laugh just looking at the illustrations, even though it's just complimentary to the text. Um, in some cases, there's a whole other story going on that, you know, it's just, it, it's very, very funny. Like even with, um, oh, Little Red Rhyming Hood, because he is Greek, this boy in here, I realized, um, is wearing the jersey of the famous Greek NBA star that I can't pronounce his whole name, but they call him the Greek freak. And that's his jersey number. And so, you know, these illustrators get to have fun with it too. So um, anyway, I love yeah, that. Patrick has so much fun with your books. He really does. It's so fun to see all the little details that he hides in there like that. <laughs> now we have a, a one more question time for one more let's go ahead with it um how many revisions megan asked how many revisions do you typically uh rhyming texts go through um and do you find that you write more sufficiently now more than when you first started huh um yeah so i mean i even my very first book shoes for me i always tell kids you know how many times do you think i rewrote or revised this and they're always like you know three five and I was like 72 um <laughs> but what I also tell them is that each iteration might I might have only changed one word or took out a stanza and then the next iteration I put it back in and I just put it somewhere else so sometimes it's a rearranging game sometimes it's um I know what I want to say but there are literally you know nothing rhymes with orange type of a problem where I have to just rework how to say something. So it's always a little bit of a puzzle. So in that sense, I feel like I've gotten better um, because I know how to attack those kinds of problems or those tricky, you know, or I want to use the word, you know, foil, but that's a, is it a two syllable word or a one? So then I'll have to figure out, maybe I don't want to use that word at all because I don't want anyone to stumble over the rhyme when they're reading it. So, um, you know, those kind of things just come with, I write a lot in rhyme and I start to realize, uh, don't go there <laughs> or I can handle this. And then sometimes I try to put in more complex words for kids to learn, not a ton of them, but even in um, Mary Had a Little Lab, I have, um, you know, she makes a sheepinator and then they have to press the woolly duplicator and that will make the make the next sheep. And then I'll ask the kids, does anyone know what duplicate means? And you, I mean, lots of hands go up. So it's fun. Um, and so I always try to challenge, but not overwhelm, you know, with with some of the text. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I didn't really answer the no, number of times I revise. I mean, it's like ongoing. Um, and it depends, you know, right now I'm writing this, this story that I can't sort of find the through line to because it's a, it's a nonfiction and my critique group just sort of said, oh, why don't you make it this? I said, well, that means I have to like cut out four stanzas out of the 15. So that means I have to rewrite like a quarter of a, the book. But so then I will just start over with, you know, that section of the book. Um, and sometimes it's not as drastic. Sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, I think you are just trying to serve the rhyme here, which is often what my critique group will say, where it means, you know, I've 
kind of it's a little filler and I try to get away with it and they'll call me out on it every time so um yeah I mean some books feel like they write themselves and then it's only a few revisions and tweaking and, and polishing and then other books I feel like um you know I've scrapped half of it and I start over again so anywhere between a month and six months to get something right um sometimes it's you know sometimes it's really feels really quick and natural like my little golden books they're because they're for like two to four years old I have a lot more uh, or should I should say that I have a lot less wiggle room so I kind of know it has to be a simple story arc I can't drop in crazy words because these are just you know they're just getting exposed to books and so in some ways it's easier in some ways it's more challenging but um yeah so I like the Megan said she shows always her revising, but yeah. I will say I love the I love the revision part. That's my favorite part. The hardest part for me is sitting down when I think I have an idea and then I'm getting something down on the page and it just doesn't it's not even close to what I want it to be. So once I get that first draft down, then I'm like, oh, OK, I can breathe. Now I have the clay to work with. But like coming up with the clay sometimes is the hard part. Definitely. I like Megan said she shows her students 40 revisions of one of her manuscripts when they complain about asking to revise, which I've done that yes. when I was an editor. If I had a new writer who didn't want to revise, I just would give them a markup. Like here's here's my own self revisions and here's like a whole doc of red. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> like, and I will I will tell them like, um, you know, I try to make it less daunting where I'll say like, this is your opportunity to put like really juicy words in. So when I talk to kids about editing and revising, I'll say, you know, okay, she went to the store, something so basic. And I say, you just need to get the, what is she doing? Where, what does your character need to, where does she need to go? What is she going to do? And then we revise it together. Like, well, what's she, who's she? Okay. Jessica, Jessica went, well, went that's kind of did she skip did she hop did she do cartwheels down the street to get to the store and then when she got what kind of store then when she gets there what's she gonna buy or what's she gonna look at in the window and admire and then all of a sudden we've got like three sentences from that one very basic sentence and i tell them that's actually a revision like you are now making it shine and sparkle and um, as opposed to, you know, you have to get that first word, the first sentence down and that's okay. And it's not supposed to be wonderful and amazing. You just need to get the story down. Then you get to go back and, and make it fun. And I said, so, you know, don't be afraid to revise. That's when you get to really, you know, put in all those juicy words. So For sure, I tell yeah, them the that they need a sentence sandwich. They need a capital and punctuation and then all the filling inside. Yeah. So. I love that analogy. Yeah, because that's, yeah, writing's not the biggest part of the work. It's the revision and the revision's the fun part. That's where you get to, like you said, put all the juicy fun stuff in. That's where the real story is. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so we're, we're, we went a little over, but it was such a fun discussion. So I didn't want to like stop. <laughs> I feel like I did a lot of just yammering. So hopefully it was actually a discussion. <laughs> it was tons of fun. So like I said, you know, uh, Sue's other books with us, uh, like I mentioned, Art Gives More, From Here to There, Mary Had a Little Lab, Little Red Rhyming Hood, and The Princess and the Petri Dish. Those last three are the fractured fairy tales that she's done with Petros. There's so much fun. Those are all available right now. The fourth fractured fairy tale um, is coming out in April this next year, Goldilocks and the Three Engineers. Um, that one is available for pre-order right now. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for talking to us. If you guys have any questions you. later, you can reach out to us at Marketing at Albert Whitman. We're happy to help with any questions. Um, Sue, so do you wanna tell everyone where they can follow you on social media? Oh, sure. It's not very creative, it's just my name. So Instagram is Sue Fleece, um, Twitter is Sue Fleece. And um, I am on, you. I do have a YouTube channel, but you could just go to YouTube and, and search on me. Um, Facebook is sue.fleece.author. Um, yeah, those are the main ones. I have a Pinterest page, but I kind of fell out of love with Pinterest. So um, <laughs> I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram, so. Great. And um, also, if you guys would like to watch, uh, we did record this session. It will be up in our booth shortly. And um, we'll also have it on social media as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Sue. Yes, and uh, to everyone that joined us, thank you for joining. So Great questions. Yeah. Have a great have a uh, rest of your everyone. Sunday and a happy Thanksgiving. You too. Have a great NCT, everyone. Bye. Thank you.
Bye.